commence the final presentation and discussion for today. Uh, to start off the presentation on lessons from the Dominican Republic on private industrial zones, we have Mr. Juan Jimenez. Mr. Jimenez is an economist from the Dominican Republic and the managing partner of the consulting firm, Apricus Consulting Group, and he will be joining us virtually. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you today and warm regards from the Dominican Republic. I will share my screen to present the case for private industrial zones in the Dominican Republic. I hope that everyone can see the presentation. So for today, um, I shall present to you first some general information about the Dominican Republic, and then see the past and present of free trade zones in the country, and then a case study of an industrial park. So talking about the Dominican Republic, um, our country numbers, we are um, two thirds of an island in the Caribbean, uh, very close to the United States. So um, our population is um, 10.4 million uh, people. Uh, pre-COVID, with a GDP per capita of uh, $8,500. Um, that's not PPP, that's current dollars. Uh, we've had an average growth rate of the GDP per capita of almost 11% for the last um, almost 30 years. Uh, we are a very open economy. Our imports plus exports would be 51% of the GDP. And we are a service economy more than almost two thirds of the GDP comes from services, but a third would come from both industry and agriculture. We're a very stable country with a um, lot of political stability, no terrorism, very little violence. We would be fifth in Latin America. And we are the country with the highest GDP per capita growth and uh, GDP growth for the last um, six years. So it's not only that we have a very good average for the last 30 years, but also in recent uh, years, you can see that we have a higher GDP per capita than Panama, for example, that it's a very uh, dynamic country in the region. We've had uh, a change in the country. In the 70s and 80s, we had a, an economy that would be very dependent on import substitution strategy uh, and agricultural exports. So that was the description of the country for the 70s and the 80s. Of course, in the 80s, we had the debt crisis that happened in almost all Latin American countries. So in the beginning of the 90s, we took advantage of the crisis. It was very tough. Uh, we even had a double digit inflation, negative GDP growth in 1990s. So we took advantage of that crisis to promote certain structural reforms that ended up being very successful. And we adopted a, an export promotion strategy, both in services, tourism, and in goods would, would be um, the free trade zones. And since that, since those uh, reforms, we've had very high economic growth with uh, price stability, and uh, we've seen a reduction in poverty and an improvement in almost all social indicators. Our export basket has changed. You can see that since 1990s, we've grown a lot in the services, not so much in agriculture. Um, you can see the yellow share in here. But it's interesting to see that um, if you see the, the, the blue ones, those are electrical equipment and medical devices. So we've developed a very diversified export basket um, since we had those reforms in the 90s. So prior to the 90s, we would have uh, almost 70% of our exports would be agricultural. And now most of our exports come from services because of tourism and uh, from the free trade zones regime. This is our product space. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, visualization. So what you can see is how 
our export basket has been changing. If you see here, the, the uh, green ones, these are the uh, garment industry. The yellow would be agricultural exports. And the blue ones that you would see in the left um, appearing, those would be both electrical equipment and medical devices. So let's see how we've changed. That was the product space in 1995. Uh, you can see that we've developed these two big um, circles that are blue in here, those are electrical equipment and no. All right, so that should be not 1995, but 2012. And this is the most recent one. Um, and you can see that many, many colors. So we've developed the chemical um, industry, which is the purple in here. We've developed the medical devices. We'll talk about that later. Um, so free trade zones, uh, we have in the country 79 um, industrial parks, uh, world-class service and infrastructure. We have public parks, private parks, mixed administration. Um, and in, in these parks, we've, we've received many uh, awards such as best free trade zone in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So this has been a very successful concept that we've, uh, we have developed here. So right now, most of our companies are established in, in private parks. Um, so you can see in here that 50.1% of all the companies that are located in the free trade zone regime are in uh, private parks. Then we would have public parks, uh, only 15.7%, 11.4% in mixed, and special zones, uh, almost a quarter, and we have special zones for services and for certain agricultural exports. But as you can see um, down here, most of the parks are private. So this is a very private sector industry that, um, that we have. We have industrial parks almost everywhere in the country. That is a map of the Dominican Republic. And where you see uh, these dark blue, those are the provinces in which we have uh, industrial parks. And only in certain parts of the country that are at the, near the border with Haiti, we don't have parks. Uh, the reason being that they are not connected to a very good port. And that's, uh, that's why it's not very feasible to have industrial parks because most of the companies that are in these free trade zones, they are exporting companies. So they are part of a global value chain in which we import uh, inputs mostly from the United States. And then we process those in, uh, inputs and we send parts of a, um, let's say a medical device and electrical equipment. As you can see, uh, this is a sector that has been growing quite a lot throughout the years. So in the 90s, uh, we had a very, very high growth, mostly garments. Uh, then at the beginning of the 2000, uh, we had a decline because we lost uh, competitiveness relative to Asian countries. And then since 2009, these new sectors, mainly medical devices and electrical components, they've uh, grown quite a lot. And that has, let's say, um, given a new life to the sector. As you can see, um, 10 years ago, we had 48 parks. Uh, right now we have 79 parks which is a growth of almost 50%. So this has been a very dynamic sector in recent years. In companies, we've seen quite a high increase from 555 companies to 734 in 2021. And we have a almost 200,000 people working uh, directly in the sector uh, with accumulated investment of almost $6 billion. Right now, uh, we have more than $7 billion in export. That would be second most important export after gold. Um, again, 79 parks and 734 companies um, last year. 
In terms of what we export, so we are currently exporting to more than 129 countries um, and 1,744 products. Um, this is pre-COVID at the beginning of 2020. So most of our exports, 27% uh, are medical equipment. After that, we have electronic apparel, 16%, tobacco, very important, um, handmade tobacco, 17%. Uh, and then garment is only 12% because this is a sector in which we've been losing competitiveness, as I mentioned before. Most of uh, important brands in almost every industry are located in the Dominican Republic. You have uh, electrical equipment, let's say General uh, Electric, uh, we have Baxter Brown um, Echo Lab in medical devices. Uh, in garments, we have Haynes, Johnson & Johnson. In tobacco, we have Davidoff. In footwear, we have Adidas, Timberland. Just to give you certain examples of very, very famous brands that are located in the country. We've positioned ourselves a uh, very... Uh, respectfully in the field. We are first global exporter of hand-rolled cigars. We are first exported to the United States of uh, electrical switches. We've, we are fourth exporter, uh, Latin American exporter of medical devices to the United States. Third world exporter, uh, Latin American exporter of footwear. Second exporter of women's wool coats to the United States. Second um, Latin America exporter of um, aromatic candles. Talking about medical devices, which is a sector that has developed um, for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, so w five of the, of the world top medical devices manufacturer are located in the Dominican Republic. Our products include ostomy appliances, surgical drapes, electromedical instruments. Um, so not only um, garments for the medical device sector, but also certain instruments that they use. Within the free trade zones, right now we are developing a subsector uh, for services. Um, as you can see in here, we have a very successful call center and uh, business professional operators in the country. Uh, in the services, call centers and BPOs are 50%. Logistic services, that's something that we are investing quite a lot recently. We want to be a hub in the Caribbean. And those would be the two most important ones, um, technology, industrial services, and other services with um, smaller share. In call center and VPO, uh, we have uh, taken advantage of the Dominican diaspora. Uh, we have many Dominicans living in the United States. Um, I would say about a million Dominicans in the United States. Some, some of them uh, have seen the growth and success of the call center and VPO sector. Um, they pay reasonably well. And that's why since they can speak English, they, uh, they have relocated in, in the Dominican Republic because they can have a good job here. In terms of what has been the, um, let's say key advantages uh, of the Dominican Republic um, for foreign companies to establish here. So we have very, very generous tax exemptions. I'll talk about that later. We have excellent infrastructure because they are private provided. So within the industrial park, the, um, the operator of the industrial park, they have to invest in very good infrastructure um, so they don't rely on government funds to invest in that infrastructure. Um, so it's a real estate business. We have preferential access to both the United States and the European Union markets. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, proximity to the United States, we are taking advantage in recent years of the um, of the market share that um, needs a very very rapid response because of um, e-commerce. So we are the country that is um, with Mexico 
the closest to the United States. So just in time industry um, has given us certain advantage because we can um, produce in a day um, and that would be in the United States um, in less than three days. So that that coincides with the time that um, uh, most e-commerce platforms use. Um, we have very legal, um, we are a very legally stable country. So we, we haven't changed the legal regime for the free trade zone in, in 30 years. And very important, we have a very good public-private dialogue in which the government quickly respond to private sector needs, let's say permits, um, lobby in the United States. So uh, that helps a lot. I'll talk about that later. So in terms of tax exemptions, we have 100% exemption of income tax, value added tax, um, tariff, certain um, selective taxes such as insurance, fuel, uh, assets, patrimony. So once firms uh, locate here, they have 100% uh, tax exemption for 15 years in which we cannot change that. Um, but most of the time, we, we just, um, after the 15 years, we renew the tax exemption. But for 15 years, even if we change the legislation, um, we have to respect those um, years uh, for which the company have these um, tax exemption. The institutional framework, uh, there is a public private committee, which is the uh, supervisor and regulator of the, of the sector. Um, so we have the council for uh, free trade zones, uh, which is in charge of appro approving new parks, establishing firms under the free trade zone regime, including the tax exemption. Uh, it's a coordination body of the government, so it also coordinates government response to uh, private sector needs, and it also coordinates promotion of the country in international forums. So um, let's say that this committee is the one that um, responds to uh, investment in which there is economies of scale. It has five members of the public sector, Minister of Finance, Minister of Industry, and also five members from the private sector. So in the industrial parks, uh, as I said before, this is a real estate business. Um, so they invest in all the basic infrastructure within the industrial park. Uh, they also give services to the firms, such as uh, payroll services, um, administrative services. So firms locate in the park and it's kind of a cost unit for multinationals. FDA promotion. So the government through the National Free Trade Zones Council, they promote the country in specialized furs, magazines, articles, but the country, not an industrial park in particular. And through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, we contact firms in different countries to promote the country for foreign direct investment. But then industrial parks, there is a very big competition within the industrial parks and they compete for big companies. So once we get, let's say an important con company to come to the country and um, consider the Dominican Republic for um, investment, then we bring the executive to the country and the industrial parks arrange their visits and their offer and negotiation. Uh, foreigners living in the country, of course, we have hiring limits. Um, companies can only hire 20% of their payroll, uh, foreigners, but most of the employees in the free trade zones are Dominicans, I would say 97% of employees, including in managing positions, they're Dominicans. Uh, companies can get work permit for their employees. Let's say they want to bring a CEO from their um, their home country. Um, they get the, the permits usually 60 to 90 days. And once uh, they get the permit, they get the visa and they can stay for as long as needed. 
no limits to exchange rate conversion, money repatriation, travel, so on and so forth. Spillovers to local companies. Um, so we have many Dominican companies managing the industrial parks. So most of the industrial parks are owned by Dominicans, but most of the firms, um, especially most of industrial firms are multinationals. We have Dominican firms only in services and agricultural sector. Spillover, uh, we have some local companies that give uh, services to the companies located in the free trade zones. In terms of su supply, we have to admit that most of their inputs are imported. So we have very limited backward linkages because multinationals are part so they are a very large value chain in which the, um, let's say, the headquarter in the United States, so they negotiate the, the suppliers of the different um, subsidiaries that they have in different countries. So uh, in here, they only do certain parts of the process, of the industrial process, and then they export that to the United States or other countries for another um, value added. Uh, such as finishing um, services, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's why there's very limited backward linkages. Uh, we also have very limited entrepreneurship. Very few employees from the, uh, these firms end up establishing their own firm. This is different, let's say, to Guatemala. In Guatemala, um, many foreign companies abandon Guatemala because they changed the legislation. So in the garment sector, uh, they develop many local firms um, to supply the previous employer, but that hasn't happened in the Dominican Republic because multinationals um, stay here, except for the garment, uh, for the loss in competitiveness that we had in the beginning of the century. So I would finish with a case study of a new industrial park. My firm did the pre-feasibility study for the most, uh, let's say the biggest industrial park that is being um, about to be developed. Um, and I think this is important because this can give you certain information about um, the private uh, version of the um, of this business. So this is a new industrial park that would be located near Caucedo port. Caucedo is the most important port in the country. So this would be the biggest industrial park in the country, 4.9 million square feet, uh, of which 40% would be basic infrastructure. Um, most of the industrial parks are uh, 30 to 40% uh, basic infrastructure and the rest would be um, industrial units. Um, so we're planning to have 60 units of an average area of 55,000 square feet each. Some companies hire two units, three units, um, but we rent each unit of an average 55%. But of course, we build the units um, in accordance to the needs of the client. This is a high-end industrial park. Uh, most of the companies we are expecting would be in the medical equipment and electrical component because these are the firms that require the uh, best services, but also these are the firms that pay the highest rent. Um, they pay a rent of 9.5 cents uh, annually per square feet. Um, garment companies pay usually six to seven uh, U.S. cents per square feet. Footwear would pay six to seven as well, and um, and agriculture would be even even less. So capex, we this this would require a forty four million dollar initial investment in both the land and the basic infrastructure, and the units you only build the industrial units once you have a contract with a firm. Um, so let's say that you have a contract with uh, Haynes, for example, they would require their um, technical description of the unit, of uh, a certain height, a certain 
a certain temperature, certain distribution of the um, of the area. And once you have the contract, uh, you hire an engineering company, and that would take three to six months on average of construction time. But you don't, so you don't build unless you have a contract. Um, in terms of income and OPEX, as early as in the third year, once you have uh, about four units that are rented, your EBITDA turns positive. This is normal because this is a high capital intensive um, investment. So OPEX is normally very low. Equity holders would receive a positive um, dividend in the 12th year. So in the first 40 years, we calculated an IRR of 12.8%. Um, this is reasonably well in this country and with an MPV of uh, 37 million um, in the first 40 years. Um, this, and we have these very good numbers because most of the parks are already uh, full capacity. So if we add up all the industrial parks in the country, well, we have 98% of uh, land already hired. So we have many companies visiting the country and they don't, um, they don't get a, a unit because parks are uh, overwhelmed. So this is why we um, these investors uh, saw a an interesting opportunity, and uh, this is why we're getting a very very high IRR in this uh, context. Most of the income comes from unit rents, ninety percent of the income. Of course, you also give services to these companies, uh, payroll services, hiring services, admin services, but uh, you do that not because of the income, but um, as, uh, as a way to get companies because the uh, especially multinational companies, they don't want to deal with um, Dominican uh, labor law um, and regulations. So they hire a service company that would do everything for them. Most of the expenses are related to infrastructure maintenance. Uh, as I said before, this is a capital intensive uh, industry, uh, the park uh, administration, the rest would be payroll and marketing. Uh, parks invest a lot in marketing uh, because they have to visit companies abroad to bring, um, to bring them uh, to invest in their parks. Last slide, um, of course, we've seen a deterioration of the project finance. Uh, when we did the numbers in early 2021, the IRR was 18.8%, uh, but we've seen an increase in utility, construction costs, an increase in the interest rate. Uh, that's why we have the NPV reduction from 82 million to 37 million. And IRR went down from 18.8 to 12.8. But um, despite this decline, in the project finance numbers, um, this is still a very good business in the country. So this would be my presentation and I'm happy to receive um, questions and um, anything you would like to know. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. Please remain online as we invite our panelists to the stage. May I first invite Mr. Thilan Vijay Singh, the chairman and CEO of TW Corp Private Limited. and Mr. Murtaza Jaffaji, Chairperson of the Advocata Institute and CEO of JB Securities Private Limited, on stage to continue the discussion on private industrial zones. Thank you. Um, let me give you the context uh, why we are having this discussion about industrial zones, private industrial zones. The key challenge that most investors, especially foreign investors have, is what is called the coordination problem. So if you want to set up in a greenfield area, you will have to get more than 16 approvals. And we don't have the concept of one government in Sri Lanka. So any potential investor has to be able to jump from one agency to another to get all the necessary approvals. Now the case for industrial parks 
is think about it similar to a mall. So mall, you know, you have standardized shops uh, and you can go and rent out a standardized unit, all the air conditioning and cleaning and most of the allied services all taken care of. So a similar view was taken in setting up industrial parks globally. And of course, they have the benefit of certain fiscal incentives like duty-free and tax-free because they were initially targeted for export. Now, if I can uh, pivot to Tilan, um, you have been a former BUI Director General and the Chairman. Uh, I believe the first industrial park was set up uh, in Katunayaka, Free Trade Zone, in 1978, when the Greater Colombo Economic Council was set up. For the benefit of our audience, why don't you take us through the evolution of Free Trade Zone cum industrial parks in Sri Lanka? Uh, thank you, Muthasa. I'll be as brief as I can, but it's an interesting evolution and story. So, I have seen pictures at the Katunayak and Biagama zone, taken in 1981, where Prime Minister Mahathir Mohammed and Jiang Zemin, who became Prime Minister of China, come into Sri Lanka to study our industrial zones, 1981. Um, in 1992, the private sector built its first industrial zone. DFCC built Lindell uh, because that was a property that evolved on them on a, on a loan that was gone bad. Then, when I became chairman in 1995, uh, we had just three zones: Katunayaka, Biagama, and Pallakali. Sorry, four. Koggala. The then government, uh, in consultation with the then president and finance minister C B K we decided that we were going to aggressively build EPZs for the very reason that Murtaza just pointed out, because of all the plethora of uh, approvals that you have to go through with local governments, etc. So we built eight zones, actually seven EPZs and one IT park area in Malabi. I'll get to that in a second. Increasing EPZ lands by 400% over five years. Sita, Avaka, Horana, Watupitevela, etc. On top of that, we took a decision that the government would provide a budget allocation to the BOI to, to improve the township surrounding both the existing zones and the new zones. So we did water supply schemes, um, upgrading schools, hospitals, etc., and building the Katunayaka cricket grounds um, and uh, the, the Biagama sports complex, all for the benefit of the community that lives around, in and around the area so that the objective was that investors and the workers could get on better together. In fact, uh, it was I who donated the Palakele Cricket Stadium next to the Palakele Zone to the Cricket, cricket Board. Um, then, in terms of IT parks, it was then Minister Mangala Samarivira and a team of us who designated the entirety of Malabi as an IT zone and Millennium Information Technology was given special concessions to open their campus, and Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, which was actually founded by the BOI through a grant funding process, which now has 12,500 students located in Malabar also during that time. So what was, the, what was the outcome of this? I think, Mutasa, it's important to note that the 95 to 2001 period because of the fact that we focused on export orientation, I'm going to quote from uh, Professor Premachandra's statistics. During that period, uh, exports as a percentage of GDP grew from 28 to 34%, and even the tradable to debt um, ratio also improved during that period. And that period is the only period in the longest period that Sri Lanka never went to the IMF because of the focus on exports. During that period, the Martin Trust, MAS, Brandix built 30 factories. YKK came, Texture Jersey was built, Lodestar, which is now Michelin, came during that period. In the IT field, we also interestingly made the whole of the World Trade Center an IT park. What did we do? When Virtusa signed the agreement with me in 1996 or 97, I can't remember, I was told, where should we locate our business, Virtusa? Um, so I said, why, why Chris Kanagaratha, why are you asking me this question? Oh, we can't find a place with proper bandwidth. So I went to my board, I said, allocate me a, a budget. We laid a fiber optic cable through the entire backbone of the World Trade Center. And that's where Virtus started its business. Because it was 70% unoccupied in 1996, the, the World Trade Center. Um, then in the brief history, 
somewhere in 96, we decided to invite the private sector to build a zone and we signed an MOU. That was the time the Koreans and the Malaysians were exporting their labor intensive industry to countries like Cambodia, Laos, and Sri Lanka. So during that period, the BOI acquired 1,200 acres from Kotagala plantations in Horana and signed an MOU with Land and General Berhard to build a private industrial zone. Unfortunately, with the 97 crash, that project didn't go ahead and the Board of Investment went ahead and did the, did the investment themselves and invited a private party to do the housing development. That project has not uh, succeeded that much. So, what happened in terms of our initiative to bring private parties in, in the late 90s was primarily the East Asian currency crisis. Then we had three parties building mini, what, are, what we call niche zones, and that's something we, we need to think about in the future, not these mega development projects. We had MAS taking over the dilapidated Tulhiria complex and creating the MAS fabric park, which is a brilliant project. The growth of Nike's export business from Sri Lanka arose because they took over that defunct asset. Then we had a gentleman from Sweden called Rune Flint, who built a mini zone in Khadavata with 11 enterprises on an extent of about, I can't remember, 20 odd acres, where one of those enterprises made sensors for Airbus and Boeing that went on their flaps. And those sensors were designed by Sri Lankans. And this particular factory won a bid from British Aerospace in order to supply uh, Boeing and uh, Airbus. Unfortunately, Mr. Flint became old. He had some fi financial difficulties. So I, as an investment banker, helped him sell the industrial zone to Akbar Brothers. And today, Akbar Brothers owns that particular industrial estate. And then we must remember the, the work done by Jeevan Janam in building Orion City. That's an, a classic example of a private industrial park. Two more examples. Um, Somewhere in 2018, I believe Rojana from Thailand wanted to build a private industrial zone. I tried to help as PPP chairman. It ran into problems. I was told there was some funny uh, influence being influenced. I, I personally believe there were some corrupt elements that came into play. They walked away. Um, then we had Hambantota. Hambantota, personally, I am opposed to the deal, very simply. Because we gave up a port for 99 years, never negotiated the industrial zone to have proper infrastructure, whether it's public investment or private investment. And there was a company that was willing to invest in the industrial zone, and we didn't. We gave up the port. We didn't have the industrial zone. Therefore, we, were, we failed to capitalize when COVID came, when there was a complete supply chain shift towards this part of the world, including India, uh, Philippines, etc. Had we had the infrastructure, the social infrastructure and the physical infrastructure adjacent to the port, we would have benefited. So that deal was not properly negotiated, I'm sorry to say, uh, Harsha. Uh, the, you know, you had nothing to do with it, neither did I. Um, so um, one final evolution in this whole saga is the port city. Port city, uh, it was actually uh, at a meeting held with the now president, uh, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe in April 1995 that I pitched the idea of making it a special economic zone. Uh, Harsha and I worked on what was to be a fantastic law which was focusing on nothing but ease of doing business. It was not about 40-year tax holidays, nothing else, but we benchmarked the, how can we go from number 100 to top 25 in ease of doing business, drafted a super PISA legislation. This government, government comes into whatever the government that came after Hapal, uh, threw it in the dustbin, and we have a substandard law that needs to be amended. Uh, and, and, and essentially, Port City is, in my view, a commercial failure. Uh, only about 17 acres of land has been formally signed up. I, 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 my company was financial advisor to all, all of that. But it is a commercial failure because of a whole host of other factors. So that's basically our history uh, in, in, in seven, eight minutes, hopefully, uh, okay. of Sri Lanka's story. Thank you, Tilan, for outlining that. If I can pivot to you, Juan. Um, now, uh, our industrial parks, which are owned by a government entity called the Board of Investment, the largest ones are about 300 acres, uh, which is 120 hectares. It's about 120,000 uh, square meters. I think square meters is what you will understand. 
um, the the industrial park that you are advising on, what is its size? The amount of land? So it would be 4.9 million square feet. Okay, 4.9 million square feet is about 480,000 square meters. So that would be, for the local audience, about 1,200 acres. Uh, now, Juan, uh, one of the big challenges that we will have in Sri Lanka in the context setting presentation which came before this is 82% of the land here is owned by the government. Now, how did you manage to get uh, 4.8 million square feet of land? Is the land owned by the government or how did you get your hands on that? Yeah. So most of the land in the country uh, is owned by the private sector. So the government has uh, land in previous uh, big agricultural um, areas because the, the sugar industry was in the public sector like 50 years ago. Uh, but the government is happy to um, sell the land if the private sector wants it, because it would be a better use of, of an asset. Um, as I said, we have uh, about 12 industrial parks that are owned by the government. The only reason being that the private sector doesn't want the land, because um, it's not, uh, here we don't see that government should manage industrial parks uh, or do business, you know. In here, we're very convinced that government needs to legislate, um, protect citizens, and give uh, good public services, but not in the, in the economic sector. Um, so it's really easy to, to get land here. Uh, of course, it's a matter of price. Uh, but even that, I can tell you that um, when we have a foreigner that wants to invest in an industrial park, the government would help them uh, to get uh, different options and uh, build the infrastructure and the permits uh, with the local government. So the government is here, it's not land owner, but business um, facility. And Juan, uh, can foreigners own land in the Dominican Republic? Yes. They can. Absolutely, right. yes. So, uh, obviously, the in incentive to come into industrial zones, uh, it's more than ownership. Now, in Sri Lanka, foreigners can't own land. Uh, there are restrictions. Uh, so, most of the investors who go into industrial zones, they get on a lease. Um, so, okay, you get the land. Uh, now, if a private person wants to set up an industrial zone, uh, do you need special permission to set up an industrial zone? Is there a permitting regulation? Can you enlighten us on that? Sure, yes. So you would need a permit from the local government um, saying that um, you can have a, an industrial use of the land uh, because we have a, a territory uh, distribution. Uh, just to give you an example, you cannot build an industrial park uh, in front of the beach, because that would be better for tourism. Um, and you also need a permit from the council, the Free Tourism Council, uh, because you're going to get tax exemptions. Um, and you would also need a permit from the um, Ministry of um, Environment and Natural Resources. So those would be the three permits that you would need to get. Again, the, the council, um, they have an incentive to help investors get the permits because, um, you know, they are their success is measured in investment, jobs creation, so on and so forth. So you would first go to the council and they would talk to everyone within the government to, to get the permits. So um, then you get government approval to build one. Uh, what happens next? I mean, you need uh, certain infrastructure facilities, uh, water, electricity, a road up to the park, I mean, a fairly large road because there's a lot more activity. How does that happen? So normally the private investor would build um, the infrastructure inside the park. 
So they would build uh, streets, they would build water treatment plants, uh, they would build the, um, the substation for electricity. Um, mostly that, unless you need a, a waste management uh, because of you know, certain activity. Um, and then the go in case you need infrastructure outside the park, you would talk to the government. Um, oftentimes the government invest uh, because uh, it's only, let's say, uh, a couple of streets to connect to the highway uh, and uh, you would create a lot of jobs and uh, people in the community would be happy. So the investment is very, uh, very much in the hands of the private investor. And you wouldn't build a single unit. Uh, and then you would go abroad and try to get clients. You would negotiate with them the, um, the distribution of the, uh, the design of the unit, and then you would build each unit once you get the contract. And finally, on this topic, uh, the customs, you said that uh, it's a duty-free. So you will have certain fiscal officers on site? How does it yes. work? So, yes. So uh, free trade zones here work as an extra territory for customs. So when companies located in the parks, when they import, it's not considered that the, um, the merchandise has entered the Dominican uh, market. It's considered an extra territory uh, for customs um, purposes. So you would have an office in each industrial park of the customs agency. And they would check that everything is fine um, from the port. So whatever you import and, and the um, document that you get in the port, then the customs inside the park would check that um, is exactly what the port authority said that you import. Um, the same for export, because um, before you had an export requirement of 80%, not anymore, because the WTO has banished that, um, but nevertheless, you still have a check um, when you have the merchandise to leave the industrial park. Thank because you. Otherwise, they would need to pay, uh, they would need to pay taxes if, they, if the merchandise enters the Dominican territory. Okay. So, uh, uh, Tilan, you, you heard him uh, briefly. If we had to do the same thing in Sri Lanka, can you lay out the steps that it is possible? Yeah, it is possible because, let me put it this way, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had a problem where the BOI would subsidize the land. And often the private sector might find it difficult to compete in order to get ROI. But now, virtually all the zones are full. So you, if you should you know, create a policy to say, hey, BOI, you cannot compete. You can compete, but compete on equal terms. Um, and then look at a public-private partnership structure. I think what uh, was mentioned was let, also let, a PVP let's structure. Take who, uh, the, the, the zone one is working. Could you get 1,200 acres of land? Yes. You can. Yeah. I mean, I would suggest uh, Horana still has about 800, no, maybe, yeah, about 800 acres vacant. Um, privatize Horana, uh, along with the land. Uh, I, I, and you could securitize the uh, rental that the uh, companies are paying. There are about 27 companies, if I'm not mistaken, in Horana. There's additional land. Um, there, there is, yeah, seven, 800 acres. There's some flood problem, which we can resolve through building a bond. Uh, so it would have to be a, a deal where the land pricing would reflect the fact that it, it, it would have to be a concessionary. I mean, if you apply market rates, I'm sure it, it's not going to be viable. And the state, like in the case of Port City, would have to provide infrastructure to the periphery of the site. And all the infrastructure would be done in, internally by the developer. The important point is, what would be the positioning of that particular zone? What is the value chain in terms of what we are trying to achieve? So, it, so I believe at this juncture, Sri Lanka needs to look, be more niche as opposed to, um, like in the case of Fabric Park or Rune Flint's uh, electronic park. But it is doable, uh, in my view. Uh, what would you do about the customs? 
similar to the Board of Investment Zones. Uh, so you could declare that entire zone under the Board of Investment Law, which means a BOI has powers to conduct customs functions. So, so it, BOI may, net, may not necessarily be managing it, but it would be declared as a license zone under the Board of Investment Law. So it's de facto, uh, you have the same uh, rights as the BOI, but it's being managed by a private party. So Juan, if I can pivot again to you, uh, agglomeration is a well-known concept in real estate. Um, clustering is something that Michael Porter spoke about. Any of those dynamics play out in industrial parks? Yes, yes. Um, just to give you an example, we didn't get certain um, companies in the medical sector because we didn't have some services, sterilization, um, temperature, uh, temperature um, reheat of certain parts. Uh, and companies, uh, for, for example, sterilization companies wouldn't locate here because they would say, you know, I cannot make an investment because you have one company or two companies. Um, so you, you do need economies of scale for certain industries. Um, I can give you another example. When uh, COVID hit, uh, I was talking to, um, to a very big company um, in, the, in, in the mask sector. I mean, the, the most important company in the mask sector. And they, we couldn't get that investment because we didn't have an, an oil industry in the country and they would need an input that comes from oil refinery. Um, so, and of course, we wouldn't get an, an, an oil refinery just to, to, to service that. Um, so we, we do see quite a lot agglomeration and, and clustering um, mostly in terms of certain special inputs and certain services. Okay. Uh, if I can ask you one other question, and then I will ask you, Tilan, to weigh in how it will apply in Sri Lanka. You mentioned about the investor promotion that the government does assist, but you have a lot of competitors, different uh, competitors, so how does the competitive dynamics play out in attracting investment? Because not only are you, when you go pitch to these American companies, there are also other Caribbean com countries also competing for these investments. And you have intra-country competition <laughs> amongst the different parks also saying, you come to my park. And then the government is facilitating the investor promotions. For the benefit of our audience, can you explain how that dynamic works out? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can give you an example. Our most important competitor in the region would be Costa Rica. Um, it's very big in the medical equipment and electronic devices sector. Uh, we are not competing very much in the garment um, sector. That would be Honduras and Nicaragua. Um, footwear, mostly Honduras. Uh, but Oftentimes, you compete in terms of a couple of things. First, um, cost. You, you need to have a matrix with all the cost with your competitors, and you have to you have to pitch that it's cheaper to produce in your country. So we all always had these um, matrix in which we would say uh, electricity is cheaper here than in Costa Rica. We have a cheaper labor. Um, we know that. Uh, education is better in Costa Rica, but then we would have these special training programs here. So cost would be one. Second would be training programs. Um, and third be um, quality of the parks. So, you know, you need pictures, videos, because um, some companies, um, they, they, they need to be sure that it's a very high-end park. Um of course, all the companies will do exactly the same. Um, and then one, once they are here, uh, we set up a schedule with the different parks. So let's say we have an investor here uh, that is going to visit the country for three days. Uh, we contact all the parks and we, set, uh, we arrange meetings and visits to all the parks. Um, so that would be how the dynamics would play. And I think that's very common in different countries that I've seen in the region.
more free trade agreements. We need to deepen our free trade agreement with India. We need to move towards ICTA with India. We need the free trade agreement with China, as the president mentioned, deeper trading ties with the UK and uh, ASEAN. Leveraging on these, we need to then build the infrastructure. And I'm not just talking industrial infrastructure, we need to have social infrastructure as well. I mean, I think Dominican Republic is a small country, and Sri Lanka, as Nayana showed, we are heavily urbanized towards areas where there is good infrastructure. So we need to find areas which are close to highways. I still personally believe that um, Hambantota has potential if he can find another investor like China Hub who had deep pockets to build port city, to build the social infrastructure next to the port. It, it, can be include, it can include worker housing, it can include uh, managerial housing, it can include recreational parks, golf courses. But at the moment, without that social as well as physical infrastructure, there isn't a water treatment plant in Hambantota as yet. So even the tire factory that was supposed to come there, I don't, I don't know whether they have even broken ground. It was supposed to be a $300 million investment. So, so trade agreements, improving social and physical infrastructure, we can find the land and, and then a proper PPP type so, structure so, to make sure so you give my, ROI. My can question was more on the investor promotion. So if you have this private and then you have government owned parks, now investor promotion the country will have to do, right? So the nexus between the investor promotion and how the industrial park gets a tenant. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Who will do the promotion? I mean, if you For have the private to party. Hmm? I think the private party will do a far better promotion than the Board of Investment. Okay. Um, board of Investment can be, be a facilitator. It, BOI need, doesn't need to travel overseas. I'm a firm believer on that. It's the private parties who are doing well, uh, the, the Sri Lankan private sector who should promote the country. Okay. I must have been the least uh, tra traveling chairman in the history oh. of BOI. So we have about five minutes more to go. Is there any questions that are coming from the audience? Yes, there is a question over here on the left. White shirt, yeah. So you guys mentioned that for your country, a lot of medical equipment was your niche. And then in other places, there's garments and in shoes. I'm just wondering whether, since you consult for industrial parks, you'd have any advice on what Sri Lanka could choose as a suitable niche target? Where to look for a good industry there? So I think his question is uh, about the product space. Maybe I can flip the question, uh, Juan. Uh, going back to the Harvard uh, theory on product space, uh, you did well on medical devices but something preceded that, that Ricardo's famous example of the forests and the trees, there were some trees that were close by that allowed you to jump to the medical devices. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, first we had garment and um, footwear. <clears throat> and um, when employees are trained, to do the to 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 work in the garment industry, uh, they can easily switch to electrical equipment um, because it's just putting things in place. It's not that we do the R and D or anything like that. Uh, it's putting things in place. Uh, not so much in the medical devices sector. It's not very uh, like the 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 hand activities is not very similar to what they do in the garment um, sector. We had to invest a lot in training employees uh, when we had the first medical uh, devices um, companies. Um, but I would say that the jump was easier from garment to electrical equipment, not so much to medical components. No, no, I said that these medical devices, are they finished products or are they components that go into other products? Oftentimes, um, components that go to other products. Can, yes, go can ahead. I just make a Comment, final yeah. uh, two-minute uh, remark? I think in terms of way forward, uh, Murtaza, I, I personally feel that either the Board of Investment Law should be amended or we should be looking at introducing a new special economic zone law uh, to cover Port City and Hambantota. We have not 
modified the BOI law to, since uh, you know 1992, if I'm not mistaken, when GCC became BOI. Uh, point number two, we as a country, I believe, need to look at agriculture special economic zones, um, where you bring in principles of real estate. In fact, I, I, if I may take, take two minutes on this, when I was managing director of Forbes and Walker, I wanted to do carbon sequestration, raise $35 million of PE, uh, and I studied the British plantation model and asked myself the question, how can I apply this to the 21st century? And this particular model, I wanted to apply to a land extent of over 30, 40,000 acres. Then someone said, you can't find this land. Then I hired two land commissioners and said, you go to Hambantura district. This is 2006, 2007. Hambantura district, Monoragala, Ampara, and Polonnaruwa. Find me degenerated forest lands or degenerated lands where less than, less than 5% has trees. You wouldn't believe it. They came back with... I'll tell you how many acres, 275,000 acres. Uh, some of that land was what, where Mattala was built. Mattala was just degenerated, uh, most of Mattala. But in Monaragal, in particular, I personally saw a 35,000 acre contiguous block of land gazetted under the forest department, not a single tree. Now, if these lands can be degazetted, Build an export-oriented agribusiness industry. We can provide food security to the whole of the Middle East, but it requires significant investment. Uh, for to get significant investment, you need to have scale. So you need to give large extents of land. So go back, going back to the British plantation model, the investor should build the housing township, should build the social infrastructure, should have smallholder plots, the nucleus plantation, and the factory that adds value. I personally believe in. You know, everyone says we have such a fantastic irrigation system also in this particular Monragala land, uh, we need to be looking at uh, agriculture, special economic zones. So that's my sort of final take. So thank you, Tilan. I will uh, come to you, Juan, for one last question because Tilan was talking about building this social infrastructure. The industrial parks that you have in your country, are they built where the people live? Or you build the parks and then expect the people to come where the parks are? No, no, no. So, so that's a very good question. Um, it's very important to reduce the, the travel time. Um, so, and I can tell you because we were looking for a land that would be close to a big housing sector uh, because uh, otherwise uh, it's not only in terms of cost, but also um, it's better if people feel that where they work is close to where they live. Because people want to go and, you know, eat, eat at uh, their houses, feel that they have their kids in school very near where they work. So um, it, it, people prefer to work close to where they live. Um, and I've seen that at least my client, he was very, very eager to invest as close as possible to where people were living. Verification. We are out of time. I would like to conclude this panel discussion. Thank you.